Ariana, well done. Well done for um, being so creative to enter this this space with me because this is an example of creativity, isn't it? It is. It's definitely new. The technology piece is a new paradigm for me that I'm still getting used to. So, Yes. And for me, that is part of like always adapting to the way the world is changing around us. That's an aspect of creativity. We have to be, we can't just communicate in the way we did, what, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. This is a totally new paradigm and it's like a totally new context. And we have to be continuously adapting, as it were, to this new environment. But how do you define creativity? What's creativity for you? For me, creativity is um, being able to um, think outside the box. That's sort of the obvious. Be able to um, imagine seemingly disconnected things and applying them together. Um, another way of thinking that is that creativity is a ability to be creative and to be creative is to cre be able to create a mood that creates a story that inspires others. So creativity is really in relation to not only others, but also into a desired outcome or to a future imagined. And so the ability to be creative is not just having a great idea. There's a lot of people that have great ideas that never, you know, um, manifest those ideas. So the ability to be creative is a muscle that is developed and it's just used to bring your ideas into fruition or into future, into action. And um, that it has um, the ability to be creative, especially in these times, is to be able to not just settle for status quo, to be always looking for new paradigms, especially now. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose it could be argued that throughout the ages, this is what our ancestors have done. They've always found new ways of doing things because otherwise we would still be living like we were living what thousands of years ago. And we have constantly been been adapting and creating new things, taking action. But what do you think makes the difference between you know people who are highly creative and those who are mediocre in the way they respond to the world i think that makes so many um ex, you know different is an extreme passion for um, a deep belief or a deep um, value system and um a tremendous amount of sort of energy or that natural inspiration that compels one beyond their own self-consciousness you know, out into the world to take the risk to to share this creative creative idea when maybe no one else, with the fear that no one else may may see or appreciate that idea. So, the, a, an extreme creative person is able and willing to take the risk to to maybe not be understood in the very beginning when they're putting their creative ideas out there. And there's something that I think really compels them beyond themselves it's like almost like they are a conduit where something's moving through them like that story or that vision is literally almost moving through them in a selfless way almost that's wanting that person to be the vessel for communicating and connecting that big vision and that new energy that wants to come in with the other people that can help make that happen because we can't really create any kind of uh, change by ourselves. We have, it has to be, I think, in connection to um, others, and it also has to have an applicability to the greater interconnectedness of all things, I think, in some way. Yes, I, I, I'd agree with you that creativity is always in a context, and it's always through connectedness with other things, other, other human beings. Um, well, not only human beings, I I think perhaps you'd agree with me that it's much more than just being connected with, with human beings. I, I know of, of your, your your love of animals, your love of nature, and your inspiration in creating a, a Gaia kind of community. So tell me more about that, um, about our interconnectedness with a world that is much bigger than our own 
small kind of individual context? Well, one of my, um, you know, in this whole concept of um, be creative is to want to change something. And I have a tremendous passion for wanting to connect human beings to the natural world, um, that being both plants and animals. And my passion to do that, the reason behind that, so my for sake of what is that I, we're all connected together. So it's not just everything that we do as human beings in whatever culture we are in is impacting every other culture, which is also the plant culture and the animal culture. And so I'm really fascinated with this new paradigm that I'm looking at, uh, taking the concept of agriculture, which our cultures have built, developed off of, you know, our agricultural practices and looking at even just that word and the word culture and the word agra. And what if we change that word agra to a, a Gaia? So Gaia, you know, G-A-I-A, a Gaia culture. So Gaia is the earth, the whole earth. So how would that shift our perspective on our agricultural practices if we changed our perspective to a Gaia culture rather than agri culture? And the other piece of that is, you know, I've, I've, I'm well studied in somatics and I train somatics to coaches and, and people all over the world. And what I really see is that we've just kind of almost been missing the point because we're looking at somatics and we're looking at healing people or even healing our agricultural practices, but on a sort of individual by individual basis. So if we shift our perspective or take a more creative perspective to um, the somatics being the mind, body, spirit, not of an individual, but of the whole earth herself, that she is the somatics. And so what if we switch our perspective to um, not just working on my somatics in my body or you working on your somatics in your body, but that we work on, oh, my body, my somatics, my mind, body, spirit, only just one of, you know, the millions of mind, body, spirits organisms throughout the earth and how would that shift our perspective so even in our let's say healing practices and self-care practices if we switch that perspective that everything i do to work or to heal my own somatics is also for the sake of trying to help rebalance and re um connect to the somatics of all that's around me um, the plants and the animals and everything that especially now with our technology in some ways it has such great things because it lets people like you and I get connected together at different time zones and, and be able to actually see each other and that's amazing and allows us to have these conversations and on the other hand it's creating um, a separation you know from the natural world in a way where if we're talking about creativity, if you put a kid in, a, in let's say, you know, a 25 by 25 square foot area and there's a tree and there's some rocks and there's some dirt and there's a little bit of water and maybe some, you know, twigs on the ground, that kid will be creative. He will create things. And a lot of that will be um, playing, but playing survival strategies, really, you know, or interactive strategies with others, but he's relating to all of everything in his environment, you know. And with the with the uh, our technology, we're we're relating with a, a much more narrow part of our senses, you know, just more of our vision, our hearing, our intellect, our mental abilities. But if we get out on the earth, it's tactile, it's sensitive, it's um, so all of a sudden, we're using all of our other senses, and we're outside, and the earth, the weather, the air molecules are changing our moods and, you know, making us feel different things on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Where, and, you know, if we're watching, let's say, a video on, on the Internet or on TV, it's creating shifts in our mood, for sure. But it's working kind of from this part of our body. Whereas when we're in nature, we're, it's, you know, we're outside, um, 
whether we're in a forest or at the beach or in grasses, all of a sudden we're, there's temperature, there's smells, um, there's the touch. It all creates more inspiration. Yes, that's so true. Um, when we think about creativity, there is a tendency to think about creativity in terms of material things that we have produced, for example, this technology that's enabling us to communicate in very novel ways. But as you rightly say, that creativity, especially for children, about being playful, using all of their senses in, in nature, but that is what is intriguing, that we're not thinking so much about creativity in terms of nature, because nature is creativity itself, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's yeah. I, I that's what I'm trying to say is I think nature is creativity itself, and um, just being outside, and you know, at first, especially when I get kids that come from the city, at first they're like, I, you know, I, I don't know what to do. Like, what's there to do? What's there to do? And then after a while, you're like, you know, um, you just don't answer their question. You just keep telling them to go outside and find something to do, and pretty soon they're lost in in, in nature and playing with. You know, kids still make games out of rocks, if that's all there is, you know. Or watching, I love watching, I live on the coast, so I love watching people on the beach and how the beach just absorbs, you know, hundreds of people. And the children just can't help but start playing in the sand and digging. And then the parents come and other kids come and other kids from other groups come and pretty soon there's a group of kids that are, you know, um, creating a world together in the sand. I mean, that's a good example. And how much space did they take up literally in the world? Not much, you know, maybe like 12 by 12. Um, there are so many city, city kids that will go out into the country and they will say, oh, I was just so bored. There was nothing to do because they don't manage to break out of that pattern of always having something to do rather than creating something to do. And they're not used to their other senses being alive. Um, so even when I have sort of the you know young thirty somethings, because we have some campsites here, uh, but, and if they're not, they're they're so all of a sudden nature's almost overstimulating. They're not used to the changes in the weather, um, their skin, their um, other sensations. Um, or even when I do my equine guided work, uh, when I have people that come from the city. You know, we might be outside for a couple of hours, two, three hours, but they're pretty tired by the time we're done. And it's not like we were running or really physical. It's that all we were using all of our senses. Our whole body was was participating, um, and that requires energy and a, a physicalness. Not like a physical strength, but like um, and a, a resilient, you know, natural resilience. And uh, an ability, and this ties right back into creativity, is to be able to create, be creative, you have to be able to have an expanded sensory awareness. You know, you're, you're, you're really expanding your senses, whether you're doing it metaphorically um, or whether you're doing it literally. So it's as though every, every sense, you know, not just the, the, the visual and the auditory, the kinesthetic, but it's... Right, every sense has to be engaged and alive for that creativity to express itself. Well, in that way, when we're in, when we're allowing all of our other senses to participate, so whether we're outside in nature or we're actually in um, a studio and we're painting, but if we're allowing ourselves to paint maybe a big picture on the wall, we're using our whole body instead of you know kind of narrowing narrowing in. So when we're doing that, we're allowing our art to expand into the whole studio, um, or even let's say we're we're creating something in our writing, in our, like writing. I do a lot of writing on my computer, but my sensory awareness is out beyond me. It's out the window. It's um, looking at the colors of the trees, and that then continues to inspire me further into the platform I'm working on. So, how do we apply? that whole sensory awareness, not just this part, but like, you know, the livingness of our body, the, the warmth and the blood flowing and the way our breath is filling 
not just our lungs and our body, but like the whole space. And then how will that shift our creativity if we expand our awareness and use all these other senses that we're, we're, we're just not in the habit of using. We're, you know, in, this, in our school systems, certainly here in the United States, you know, we're taught to sit at a desk from the age of four or five and sit there for hours. You know, and you know, not wiggle around and not have your hands past your chair or your desk. You're supposed to sit like this. Like it just whoop. so. This is part of where the future is. We have. How do we change that? What if we? Um, I mean, I was really lucky when I was a kid in the fifth grade. Um, my teachers, we didn't have any desks. We just had pillows on the floor. So it's interesting that the classroom of the, of us. We we're very we're very we're, most of us are artists actually, um, and who knows why? Maybe that's part of it because we weren't we we got an experience something different than like being you know in my little cubby. Mm. And I'd be curious. I don't know, but I'd be curious to listen from other people who work in a more corporate environment where they're experimenting and changing some of those spaces where instead of people being in little cubbies. They have more social areas where they're creating, you know, sometimes even, I know in college, like just going to the library sometimes and sitting at a table with another group of people, I may not have said anything to them. I didn't know who they were, but there was a collective energy that started to enhance each of our own creativity. Right. Your story about um, having pillows rather than chairs, that reminded me of my very first year when I was, at, I went to school in India, in, in the Punjab, and my very first lesson, I was, it was, it was open doors. It wasn't even, we didn't have a, a, a school built. It was just under a tree, basically. And my teacher told me to go and um, get a brick. That was going to be my, my seat for, for, um, for, for yeah. the duration of the lesson. And I, I remember going out to um, pick up this brick and there was a snake under it. You know, that was my that was my start of education. You know, a brick with a snake under it. Yeah, that's yeah. a great story. What a great metaphor, huh? Yes, yeah, and um, and I think that the fact that we make children sit from such an early age, we we make them sit on chairs, and this isn't a natural posture. You know, sitting is not a natural posture. I think we, you know, natural posture would be to to squat and to you know to yeah. to be moving around uh, especially as children to be moving around so much more so that's for me that's one of the ways perhaps we knock out creativity is that we adopt this stiff posture for too many hours a day can you think that, of any other things well that, that also we're we're off the floor we're off the earth mm. we've now distanced ourselves you know yeah. so we, uh, when we're in class, if we're not outside, I mean, sometimes when we're outside, we'll sit on the ground. Um, and if we're not, we'll sit on the floor in the classroom. And, um, and we may, you know, we're just that much closer. And like you said, our body structure is built for that. Um, you know, I, I've, no, I've noticed lately, because I live in such a rural area, um, where most of the people that where I live are, are they're interacting with the environment. They're surfing or kayaking or fishing or um, they hike a lot. Um, they grow food. So they're outdoors a lot. But I go into the city and I've noticed that this huge uh, high percentage of people that can't hardly walk. Like they have limps or ailments, like an extraordinary amount. It's caught my attention. So. Okay, so apart from you know, being able to experience nature. Can you think of any other pressures that inhibit or crush our creativity? Uh, I think another big one is our uh, fear of what other people are going to think. So our self-consciousness, you know, um, and that really touches back into the somatics is that our body, our animal body is, is the first responder. It's, it's, it's a sensing everything in the environment energy wise and our, our mind comes along after the fact and makes up interpretations and stories. And so if you think about it, our mind and our intellect, that rational process is 
mostly focused on what is everybody else going to think about me? And so one of the major inhibitors I see in creativity is that self-consciousness, that self-doubt. And that I, I also saw it because I used to teach um, art in elementary schools and in kindergarten, the kids would paint like maybe five or 10 pictures in, in an hour or, or so. And by first grade, and, they, and, and it just like, without any inhibition, no self-consciousness at all, really creative. And some use a lot of colors, some use a little, some drew big pictures, some drew little teeny ones, and it didn't matter. And then um, about uh, first grade, halfway through first grade, the little girl starts saying, oh, I can't, I can't draw that because it won't look like the photograph, you know? And uh, so I would say, well, think about George O'Keefe who painted big, you know, flowers and bones in the sky. Nobody would have thought of that, right? The artist gets to do anything. Um, so it was just, um, again, not only just being stuck in that, the, the rigidity of the chair, but being stuck in, you need to learn one, two, three, A, B, C, there is, this is, you need to learn what I learned. You need to learn what everybody else has ever learned. And that's the killer of creativity. You know, yeah. That, yeah. that's yeah. right. It's like wanting it to be correct. So wanting a horse to look like a horse, you know, it has to be correct. It has to be realistic. So, so creativity is like not having to be realistic, not having to be accurate, not having to have the right answer, but to have an answer. And it, 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 you know, it's, it's actually probably the primary thing I teach in my programs, um, whether it's high level leaders or youth at risk or who, anybody, you know, anybody is, and I, and I you work with the horses to produce this outside in nature. But what I'm really trying to accomplish is I, I feel like the first step is trying to reawaken people's creativity by, by encouraging them to be, tremendously inquisitive. We've asked lots of questions and we're not looking for the answers. We just want to ask as many questions as we can and keep them as open-ended. And it's really about exploring, experimenting. This is a safe place to experiment. And that takes, and then the first thing that happens, especially in adults and youth, um, but it gets increasingly more of an issue is, it, is we should shut it down. Like how we are trained to Categorize, compare, quantify, include, done, judge, done, figured it out, done. Okay, what's next, right? The, the, what, the, when we're doing our work and we want to be creative, we need to notice as soon as we start to shut it down, like this is the direction, this is where it's going to go, we need to open it up again. Like, can I think of all the possibilities? Just entertain all of them. And then once I've really laid them all out, like in a panoramic, like I said, like through the whole space of my room or my office or my studio, um, or even beyond the walls, then I can choose which one I want to do now. But I definitely, it's, you know, I like the idea of um, tremendous inquisitiveness and curiosity, curiosity. Absolutely. And in formal education, we spend so much time teaching our students how to find answers rather than ask questions. And research shows that there's a, like the proportion of questions asked by teachers to students, the ratio is 30 to one. Wow. The teacher has 30 questions per one question asked by a student, you know? So we're not teaching them how to ask questions. We're, we're just teaching them to find answers and then Yes. You know, the correct answer rather than, as you say, to be inquisitive and to to formulate questions because that in itself is 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 an art, isn't it? Forming the right questions. Well, and, and in a way, you know, I, you know, I'm totally on board with everything you're saying. I see the same thing. And I, I think in some way, um, a person who's going to be really creative has to be, for lack of a better word, a challenger, you know, to challenge the status quo to challenge like well just because like who said like where did i come up with that um and is it still relevant so things that we were taught when we were growing up at that time seemed very relevant and they were tried and true wow think of how much the world's changed since then you know who would have ever thought um 
that we'd be doing this. <laughs> Absolutely. We didn't used to have an answering machine on our phone. I mean, that's yeah. right. And obviously we're doing this because there were people before us who asked the right questions. You know, how can we, how can we cut across time and um, distance and location in order to communicate? And they came up with, they came up with the technology because they asked the right questions. Right. And they, they didn't they didn't stick with that first the first answer or the quickest answer. And the people that did in those early years, they they became what you know we call, I mean, um, you know, kind of dinosaurs really, to the point where, I mean, think about the video. Like we remember how they used to have millions of video stores, and you'd go to the video store and rent your videos. They're gone, right? They're gone because they didn't adapt. They didn't change according yeah. to the context. Yeah. All right. Okay, Ariane, it's been br brilliant speaking with you. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I look forward to more like this. I do too. Thank you so much. And um, uh, thanks for taking the time and for doing the work that you do with the creativity and bringing this work forward and, and doing it in this kind of interactive way. I'm still a newbie at it, but I know it's part of the future. And so thank you for allowing me to be on, on this webinar with you. And I hope to see you in person again. Okay, likewise, likewise. Take care. Thank you for the wonderful work that you do. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great. Okay. All right. Okay.